what keeps us up at night? Uh, three challenges to Jewish life. So um, what kept me up uh, last night was, you know, what, <laughs> what are the top three? Um, <laughs> You know, because we are a worrying people. We're the people of the book, but we, we're really good at worrying. Um, you know the Jewish telegram? You know, start worrying, details to follow. Uh, you actually remember telegrams. That's pretty good uh, right there. Um, but we'll start with, with Israel. And um, actually, there's a story about a, a famous... Israeli philosopher who came to America for a, um, for a visit and he was interviewed on, on his arrival and the interviewer said, in a word, how are things in Israel? <laughs> so he said, good. <laughs> and he said, in two words? No good. <laughs> um, so that kind of encapsulates, I, I think, uh, Israel's story today. And, uh, you know, in many ways, Israel is an incredible success story. Um, founded only in 1948, and you know, you know the story, it's, uh, I think it's third on the NASDAQ behind uh, the U.S. and China, and uh, per capita, it's, it's doing very well. Their economy is doing better than we are, the startup nation, all of those wonderful things. Um, but if you read this morning's paper or, or heard the news, uh, I mean, the truth is we are at a, an incredibly critical position today, literally today, um, which I think today might be looked back up upon years from now as the beginning of the third intifada. Uh, the first intifada was in 1980, December of 87. It seemed to start um, spontaneously. Uh, the second intifada came about during the uh, uh, peace, peace talks that were, had been going on, and, and it was a brutal, brutal time for Israel, terrorist bombs on a daily basis. I think what we're seeing now, or might be seeing now, well, you could call it the diplomatic intifada, um, because, as you know, these, these peace talks that have been going on since the summer really haven't made it any progress. Um, it appears to be that um, the only party that really wants this thing to happen is the U.S. Uh, and is knocking heads between the Israelis and the Palestinians. <clears throat> and the, 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 even that um, unsuccessful dialogue, uh, the next stage was to extend the deadline past April 29th. And um, Israel was supposed to release the last batch of, uh, of terrorists from their prisons. And they balked at it because they said nothing has, has been happening and all we do is give and all the Palestinians do is demand. So um, Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian Authority president, yesterday said, you know, he didn't say we're finished, but he basically said we're now going to plan B which is uh, to go to the United Nations and to UN affiliated agencies. There are like 63 agencies. And essentially to do an end around and uh, instead of negotiating directly with Israel to seek statehood through a very friendly United Nations, which is certainly much more sympathetic uh, to, the, to the Palestinian cause than, than to Israel. Uh, this is something that the U.S. and Israel are, are deeply, deeply uh, distressed about. And we're really going to see in the next couple of days if, if, uh, if anything positive can come of it. Uh, Secretary of State Kerry, uh, who has um, set the world record for frequent flyer miles <laughs> in the, the last year, uh, has certainly been tireless in trying to make it happen, but he canceled his trip to the Middle East yesterday and basically said, you guys you guys have to work it out and, and let us know. So 
uh, I don't want to sound like doomsday, but the, uh, as much as we have our problems with the Palestinian Authority, the alternative is Hamas waiting in Gaza uh, to take over the West Bank. So, and there's talk of the Palestinian Authority actually you know, dissolving itself if these talks fail. So there, is, there, are, there are a lot of serious concerns. And, um, and I didn't even get to Iran yet. So um, Iran, of course, is, um, has been developing uh, a nuclear, nuclear facilities, uh, won't admit that this is about creating nuclear arms. Um, but the US is so um, committed to trying to resolve this diplomatically that um, there's a fear that we're being snookered by uh, the president of Iran, who is, goes on Facebook and says, ah, "I just, you know, fooled the uh, Americans," and um, and we try we try to uh, pretend that, um, you know, it's just rain that's coming down on us and not anything worse than that. So. Um, a few years ago, I, I often go to the, something called the Herzliya Conference in Israel. It's uh, an annual conference of uh, Israeli leaders and world leaders, and they t part of the session is about Israeli security and strategic security. So i give you a great example. A couple of years ago, the, uh, I don't remember the officer's title, but he was the chief uh, strategic intelligence officer, gave his report on the state of security in Israel. And he outlined this really frightening, you know, the Hamas in Gaza has rockets and Hezbollah in the north and Lebanon has 50,000, 100,000 rockets. All of Israel is now vulnerable, uh, on and on and on. And then uh, he talked about Iran and at the end he said, so, Really, we have one existential threat to, uh, to the country, and that is from a nuclear Iran where they threaten to annihilate us. Um, but I, overall, you know, I give it a B plus, our security. <laughs> we would be, you know, we'd be, we'd be tearing our hair out about all these other things, but Israelis um, have a way of, uh, have, whether they compartmentalize their lives, or they have great faith, uh, or they're on something really good, some kind of... <laughs> uh, you know, there's, a, there's an international happiness index where they measure the happiness level of 193 countries, and Israel is always in the top 20, and sometimes higher than that. And how many of you have been to Israel? I, I figure most of you, right? I should have asked how many haven't been, but... Um, you see it. You can go during the Intifada. I remember being at the height of the Intifada and going on a media trip and having lunch outside and a sunny day in the restaurant and, you know, my wife calls and it's like, are you okay? So it's like, you know, you don't want to say, well, oh, I'm having a delightful lunch out here with all these happy people. And I say, well, I'm managing, you know. <laughs> it's tough, but... Uh, you know, can you pass the souffle? And uh, so the Israelis manage to to live with those those realities, and um, and I th and I think they will continue to. But they are they're very worried about the U.S. position and in terms of foreign policy, not only for themselves but as they see it for the region. And I think there's what to worry about. Um, whether it's Syria, where uh, the President Obama initially you know, drew his own red line about chemical weapons. If Syria used chemical weapons, then we would have to take steps to do that, and then pulled back from that pledge. Um, the talks with Iran, where Iran is still able to um, continue its program so far, and we have to hope that the monitors uh, are not being outwitted by, by Iran, uh, which won't even admit that it's trying to create a nuclear bomb when all the evidence indicates that if it was for peaceful means, they wouldn't have secret underground, you know, buried 100 feet in the ground, these, uh, 
these manufacturing places, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and of course, uh, President Putin from Russia has gotten all of our attention in the last couple of weeks. And, um, and, and we certainly, this is not whether I'm a Democrat or a Republican, I think we see the really complexity of the president's position. Americans don't want to get involved in another overseas conflict. We, we lost precious lives and trillions of dollars in Afghanistan, Iraq. We have very little to show for it. And the idea of going to war again um, in the Middle East is, is something that uh, is, is shared by, by a great majority of Americans. On the other hand, <clears throat> we see that we live in a tough world with uh, nasty leaders sometimes, and if they see a vacuum, they'll fill it. So, um, so that, that is definitely a, a serious concern. And um, as, we, as we look to these uh, really uh, faltering peace talks taking place now, uh, I think the Israelis are incredibly frustrated with the lack of any kind of sign of cooperation from the Palestinians who already said no, apparently said no to the three main issues. Um, one is there's no to recognizing Israel as a Jewish state, uh, no to giving up the right of return, which would allow uh, Palestinians to come back, not to a, the new state of Palestine, but they want to come back to Israel. They want to come back to Haifa and to to inside the, inside the 67 borders, which would um, make Israel no longer a country with a Jewish majority. And, um, and they also, the third no is that this resolution would be the end of the conflict. And so it's just, you know, it would keep going. Uh, and yet there's this, still this, this effort to, to try and make something happen. So my second concern, worry, is about the future of American Jewish life, getting a little closer to home. Uh, we are greater in number. We, we worry about our numbers, um, but our uh, we, we're, recent studies, I was gonna try and get through this talk without mentioning the word pew, um, which sounds like a Yiddish word, right? It's like, and it kind of fits the report, it's a Pew report, you know. It's, um, all of these surveys are showing, there was a New York Jewish population study two years ago, now the Pew report last year. They're finding, if you picture the Jewish community, you have um, the, a growing part that's moving to the extreme right religiously. <coughs> and, uh, and from the Orthodox community, and um, and you have a growing percentage on the other end of the uh, scale, which uh, has tripled, and that's people who say they are Jewish but they have no religion. So that went from seven percent uh, ten years ago to twenty-two percent. That's a lot of a lot of people, and the middle is getting smaller. So I guess you would call the middle conservative reform movements, um, secular, that, that's dwindling. So if I was uh, you know, running the Federation, I'd be worried about the people who are the, the backbone of Federation. That's the population that, that's, that's getting smaller. Now, the blessing and the curse of life today is, is freedom. Um, because in a sense, we, have, we are all Jews of choice. I mean, the, that's the phrase used for converts, is Jews of choice. But in this day and age, we, we're really all Jews of choice. And um, our grandparents perhaps had, perhaps they were in Europe, or they had far fewer choices about how to express their Jewish lives and identity than we do. Uh, Jews were most together, uh, not just literally, when they were in the ghetto, when there was anti-Semitism, it brought Jews together as well. In Israel, when things are calm with external problems, that's when we have the battle about 
who is a Jew. I always take that as a great sign. It means everybody, <laughs> nobody's bothering us, so it's time to bother ourselves. <laughs> so, um, but our, the barriers are down. Jews are accepted in our society. Uh, there's more intermarriage because we are desirable mates and people want to marry Jews. You know, it's funny that we, I find myself as well, so we talk about the world as Jews and non-Jews, even though we are like 0.2% of the world. So, you know, George Washington was the first non-Jewish president of the United States. It's, uh, um, There's even, you know, there's a whole genre of Gentile jokes that Jews tell, and it, I'll, I'll, I'll just try one. <laughs> so the characters here are, are not Jewish, and the woman calls her daughter and says, Mary, I know tomorrow is Tom's birthday, so I've been preparing his favorite meal. I want you to come to dinner tomorrow night. I'm making his favorite meal. I'm making his favorite dessert, that apple cake that he loves. And um, the daughter says, I'm sorry, Mom, but we can't come tomorrow. And the mother says, oh, OK. <laughs> so. Try, try telling that to people who wouldn't get it. It's, uh, okay, but, but more seriously, um, consider a statement, Rabbi David Ellenson, who was the president, uh, former president now of Hebrew Union College, the reform movement, a brilliant scholar. He spoke recently, and I heard him tell his audience, he said that we want the best in Western culture, we want to live, have the best of American society, and we want to have Jewish grandchildren, and we can't have both. Um, I'm not sure if that's too stark a statement, but it certainly gets our attention, and I think we understand his point. And even in terms of our numbers, um, we are, you know, we're, we're decreasing in that, um, Jews marry later than just about any ethnic group, probably because they're also better educated and they go to school longer. Uh, they have fewer children. And um, you know, the, as, a, as a community, we say, well, that's, that's not healthy. But how do you reverse that trend? How do you tell people you know, when to get married and how many kids to have? Um, so, a couple of weeks ago, I was at the Jewish Funders Network uh, annual conference in, in Miami Beach. And it was a fascinating conference. I was just happy to be in Miami Beach a couple <laughs> weeks ago. And uh, one of the speakers was a professor from Swarthmore, a psychologist named Barry Schwartz. And he's written a book called The Paradox of Choice, Why More is Less. He also has a TED Talk, which apparently has had millions of uh, views if you want to check it out. So he challenged the notion that I think we all have uh, is that freedom of choice is terrific and the more choice we have, the better off we are. And um, he, he said that they did this marketing study in a, a major supermarket chain that had 175 salad dressings that you could choose from. And for a week, they instead, they just had the same amount of volume, I think, but they only had six products. And they sold far more in that week than they do any other time. Um, and you can think about it as well. Mutual funds, if you see a list of 50 funds to choose from, you're probably going to be happier to see five that, that you can <coughs> pick. Um, Health care options. Um, and, and you talk to college seniors and ask them about their career choice. Uh, you don't ask college seniors, what are you going to do next year? Um, and, and part of the problem is that there's so many options. There's so many things you can do. And this professor says that those, 
multiple options paralyze rather than liberate us. We just can't deal with so much. And if you apply it to the Jewish community, um, and particularly for people who feel that we, they are no longer bound by halacha, by Jewish law, um, again, it creates this, this um, confusion. Um, at that conference, Rabbi Rick Jacobs, who's now the president of the reform movement, said that um, that's one of the issues they deal with because the reform movement is about autonomy. You, you can pick and choose uh, in terms of observance. You know, some people say they should call it the 10 suggestions. Uh, but um, he, he acknowledged that it can be very confusing for people. Uh, there was another scholar, a brilliant young scholar from Israel named Micha Goodman, and um, who's doing wonderful work there with, with young Israelis. And he said that for Israelis, um, the issue became, it, it, it was freedom from religion, not freedom of religion. That people just wanted to be done with it. And uh, that now the younger people are sort of coming back to it in terms of uh, secular yeshivas, which was unheard of. And Okay. And, uh, Anyway, Schwartz uh, had, the, had the last line, this professor, and he said, um, he said we're, he's not sure that we have enough of a center that can hold, because we have unlimited options on one end, and we have people with very strict um, requirements on the other hand. So he, he said, sure, a bird can marry a fish, but where will they live? So, <laughs> I think you know that that idea of Jerusalem was was more of a messianic dream, it, but there's a real Jerusalem now that we live in. It's and it's messy sometimes, and it has dirty streets, and it has poor people. You know, Jews talked about power for thousands of years, and because they didn't have any, and now since 1948, Jews have that power. They have country and they're struggling with the messy, difficult part of being an ethical, moral country in a very hostile environment. And um, so again, I wish that for all of us, we, um, we all find our stories to tell. That's what journalists really are. It's, journalism, I think, is a very Jewish profession. It's telling a story. And for a Jewish journalist, it's telling the story of the past in the present to help us in the future. So I hope that we sit around at our seders and it's, yes, we worry and there's plenty to worry about, but we always look to the future with hope and say, next year in Jerusalem. Thanks very much. <laughs> the question is why aren't I worried about anti-Semitism in Europe? I am. I only had three choices. <laughs> uh, I, it depends how much time you can have. You know, I could I could go on, um, but seriously, not to not to make light of it. Uh, in some ways, what happens in Europe is a harbinger of what comes this way to America. There's been a real increase in anti-Semitism in Europe for a number of years. You see more French Jews making Aliyah. Uh, British Jews are very concerned. Um, we, we, not, we, we shouldn't ignore that. The BDS movement is, is a really growing concern. Um, I think the American Jewish Committee, among the major Jewish organizations, is one of the most involved in terms of dealing with European countries. There's an election coming up in Hungary where the anti-Semitic party is, is, is growing. So yes, there's plenty to worry about. Um, can, can I tell one quick story as a way of, okay, I just wanted to end, and, um, and yes, I have written a book. Uh, it's really, it took me 20 years to write because it's a compilation of about 80 columns from uh, the Jewish week from the last 20 years. But I want to tell you that I've learned not to take my pondering uh, on you know, these big issues too seriously because a number of years ago when I was in Baltimore, the most popular column in the paper was the recipe column. I'm gonna tell you a true story. Um, one week we ran a recipe for some kind of apple cake 
and it had, you know, the ingredients and you do this and that and put it in the freezer and allow it to chill for two, and we, so we had a, it was supposed to say two HRS period. Yeah. It said two YRS period. <laughs> so, so this is a true story. I can't tell you how many phone calls, uh, <laughs> angry phone calls I got, I mean, this recipe and it's terrible. If we had written, I don't know, Golda Meir ran off you know, with a guy to Cleveland, we would have gotten five calls. But <laughs> So three weeks go by, four weeks go by, Sunday morning, I'm home, 7.30 in the morning, phone rings. I answer the phone, is this Mr. Rosenblatt from the Jewish paper? And I thought it was somebody, you know, like pulling my leg, a friend of mine. It was, it was a lady calling from Pennsylvania. She says, I'm calling about the recipe for the apple cake, and you made a terrible, m I said, I mean, I'm a very patient guy, but I like had it up to here. I said, excuse me, that was no mistake. <laughs> I said, it's supposed to be extremely cold. <laughs> and, you, and you know what she said? She said, oh, I'm sorry. It's just, I must have sounded so emphatic. So, so any, any day now, she's going to be opening the freezer. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Enjoy your day. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.